Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 294 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the 1982 Chicago Tylenol murders. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1982, the United States was shocked when seven people suddenly died in Chicago. At first, the deaths were not connected, but it was soon learned that each victim had taken the painkiller, extra strength Tylenol, just before they died. And someone had tampered with the Tylenol, making these deaths murders. Why had the Tylenol killed them? Who was responsible? And how did this series of tragic deaths change America permanently? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what should we say to begin today's mystery? Today's mystery is a true crime story, but unlike some of the true crime stories we cover, people did die in this incident. However, as always, we will be keeping things clinical, so we won't be going into sensationalistic detail about how they suffered, though we will be hearing some audio clips from people who were eyewitnesses at the time. We'll cover the murders themselves quickly in just a few minutes at the beginning of the episode, and then things will proceed at a lower, slower key. Uh, but sensitive listeners and parents with young or sensitive children should be aware of this before we begin. We try to mention it when one of us has a personal connection or memory of a case. I, I remember this in the news as a young teen myself. Do you remember when this happened? I certainly do. It occurred when I was in high school, and people around the country were very concerned about it. It was all over the news. In fact, in researching this mystery, I ran across an analysis that indicated that if you count the number of news stories run on this, this was the most covered news story since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, which we discussed back in episode 15 and also in episode 233, and which we'll continue to discuss. In addition to remembering the news coverage of the Tylenol murders, I also remember the impact it had on culture and pop culture, which I'll bring up later in the episode. So how will we be proceeding in looking at this mystery? Whenever we give the background on a historical mystery, I like to present the information in chronological order as the public became aware of it. So that's what we'll be doing here. We'll tell you what the public learned, when the public learned, and in the order that the public learned it. This means that we'll begin at a stage before people even knew that Tylenol murders were taking place. The story begins on Wednesday, September 29th in 1982, which is day one of these events. At 6.30 a.m., the Kellerman family is waking up in Schaumburg, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. However, young Mary Kellerman, who is 12 years old, wakes up sick with a head cold. Her father, Dennis, decided that she should stay home from school that day. Her mother went to work, but Dennis stayed home with his daughter. However, Dennis stated that later that morning, I heard her go into the bathroom. I heard the door close. Then I heard something drop. I went to the bathroom door. I called, Mary, are you okay? There was no answer. I called again, Mary, are you okay? There was still no answer. So I opened the bathroom door and my little girl was on the floor unconscious. She was still in her pajamas. Dennis then called emergency services. He also called his wife to let her know what was happening. According to an attorney connected with the case, Her mom was at work. Her dad called her mom and said, She's having trouble breathing. Please come home. By the time she got home, uh, she couldn't get to within 100 feet of her daughter. Police, ambulance, whatever. She sees uh, her daughter in a gurney going into an ambulance. Um, she never saw her daughter alive. What stuck with me about her mother's testimony, she was asked, what do you know about what happened that day at home while she's at work? And she said, her husband said, you don't want to know what happened that morning in the bathroom. And he never told her. It was a horrible scene. Can't imagine 
having to see something like that happen to your child. And making the decision not to tell his wife was a very brave move. And I understand that. He probably spared his wife a lot of suffering by not describing in detail what happened after he found Mary on the bathroom floor. I assume his wife also agreed that it was better not to know the details. Mary was taken to the Alexian Brothers Medical Center in Elk Grove Village, another suburb of Chicago, which is about 15 minutes away. The paramedics tried multiple drugs to try to stabilize Mary, but nothing worked. She was pronounced dead at 9.56 a.m. at the medical center, and no one knew why, because the circumstances of her young age, though, an autopsy was ordered. We now have our first victim of these crimes. Who was the second? His name was Adam Janus. Uh, he was from a large Catholic family that had recently immigrated to the United States from Poland. The Polish pronunciation of the family name is Janus, but the American pronunciation is Janus. Adam was 27 years old, and he was a post office supervisor in Arlington Heights, another suburb of Chicago. He was married to a woman named Teresa, Teresa with no H, who he had met in Poland. And they had children in a local Catholic preschool. The same day, day one, Wednesday, September 29th, he was also feeling ill and thought he was coming down with a cold. So he stayed home from work. A little before noon, he picked up his children from preschool, and on the way home, he stopped at a Jewel grocery store, where he picked up several items, including steaks for dinner and fresh-cut lilies for his wife. After eating lunch, he told Teresa he was going to go lie down, but a few minutes later, he staggered into the kitchen and collapsed. Teresa didn't speak English, but she ran outside and saw two neighbors talking. One was a nurse who spoke Polish, so she ran up to them and asked for help. Adam was taken to Northwest Community Hospital in Arlington Heights, and he was pronounced dead at 3.15 p.m. Later that day, a nurse named Helen Jensen interviewed his wife, now his widow, through a translator. So I saw this lady standing off to one side, this young woman, and I went up to her, and she was Adam's wife, the young man who had died in the morning. The neighbor was able, she was Polish, and she was able to, to uh, interpret for Helen. Helen did a, a, a great job to get that information out of somebody who can't really speak English. And she told me uh, Adam was not feeling well. He thought he had a cold and had called in sick. He had picked up his children at about 11.30, and he went to, the, um, to Jewel on the way home and picked up some Tylenol, and then came home and had lunch and then went into the other room and died. I mean, this was a shock. This is a healthy young man who was suddenly dead. Adam had two brothers who were named Stanley and Joseph, and Joseph Janus picks up the story. I was at the company working at Schwinn because uh, I got a phone call, I don't know, it was around 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. My foreman called me up. He said, Joe, you got a phone call. And then, I didn't know Arlington Heights. I didn't know where the hospital was, you know. I uh, called my, my brother Stanley, and he says, well, I wait for you. He says, we're going to go together to Arlington Heights Hospital. So I got to the hospital, and then all the family was there. And they said that Adam died of heart attack. He was a healthy man. He was a postal man. He was always on the go, and he had no issues with his heart from what the family members knew. So when they told my family that he died from a heart attack, they couldn't believe it. The second voice you heard was Joseph's daughter, Monica, and the family indeed had a hard time believing that their healthy, vigorous Adam, who had no heart problems, had just died of a heart attack. We now have our second victim of these crimes. Who was the third? Her name was Mary Magdalene Reiner, but she went by the name Lynn. She also was 27 years old, and she and her husband Ed had four children. The youngest, a boy named Joshua, had been born just five days earlier, and Lynn had just come home from the hospital the previous day. Ed and Lynn lived in the Chicago suburb of Winfield. 
But at 3.45 p.m., just 30 minutes after Adam Janus was pronounced dead on September 29th, or day one, something happened. Lynn was at home with her husband, her children, and her mother-in-law. And according to author Scott Bartz, Lynn told her mother-in-law that she felt nauseous. Lynn got up from the couch and walked into the kitchen on her way to the bathroom. Suddenly, feeling very dizzy, she sat down on one of the kitchen chairs. Lynn's mother-in-law, realizing something was wrong, rushed to her side. Outside, Ed had just pulled into the driveway, along with the Reiner's eight-year-old daughter, Michelle. They walked into the kitchen and entered what had now become a chaotic and frightening scene. Lynn was sitting at the table. Her breathing was labored. Ed's mom ordered Ed to call an ambulance. Now frantic, Ed fumbled with the phone, dropped the receiver, then quickly snatched it back up and dialed the operator. As Ed instructed the operator to send an ambulance, Lynn fell to the floor and went into convulsions. Winfield police officer Scott Watkins arrived at the Reiner's home at 3.45 p.m. He was followed moments later by emergency medical technicians from Leonard's Ambulance Service and the Winfield Fire Department. After working on Lynn at the house for several minutes, to no avail, the paramedics rushed her to Central DuPage Hospital. So Lynn Reiner was now very sick and in the hospital. We now have the third victim of these crimes. Who was the fourth? To answer that, we need to shift back to what was happening with the Janus family. Still in shock, they had gone over to Adam Janus's house in Arlington Heights to make his funeral arrangements. Those present included Adam's mother, Adam's oldest brother Joseph, Adam's brother Stanley, who was 25 years old at the time, and Stanley's wife, Teresa, who was 19 years old. And the two of them had just married three months earlier in June of 1982, so they were newlyweds. By the way, this Teresa's name has an H in it, so Adam's wife is Teresa without an H, and Stanley's wife is Teresa with an H. They were all in mourning, and many had been crying, and Stanley and his wife reported having headaches. Then, as they were talking at about 5 p.m. on day one, less than two hours after Adam had died, something happened with Stanley. His brother Joseph reports, So, when he came in, now we start talking, like he was sitting here in front of us, and he, he just fell down. So, they called the ambulance. Nurse Helen Jensen reports what happened in this scene based on what she learned by talking to Adam's wife, Teresa, without an H, through a translator. The family came together to make funeral plans, and they were all together at the house. Stanley had back problems, and he asked his wife to go get him some, some Tylenol. So she went and got the bottle of Tylenol and gave him two and then she took two out for herself. So the family immediately called emergency services. At this point, a new figure enters our story. His name is Chuck Kramer, and he was a lieutenant in the local fire department. When we got there, there was an ambulance, the paramedic squad, a squad car. There was crowds of people everywhere. And as he pulled up, I started walking up to the front of the house. I could hear screaming coming out of the house. So I ran in. And there was a young man laying on the floor. This is the brother of the first man. The first fellow was Adam Janis. This is Stanley. He's about 25 years old. And the paramedics are working on him. And as I walked in, I had a great deal of faith in these people. They were good paramedics. And I locked up, I, when he looked up at me, I could almost see the fear in his face. He said, this is the same thing as this morning. We're losing him. And while I was standing there, a young girl came up and she was hysterical. Her newlywed husband is on the floor and she was screaming, Stanley, Stanley. And she was grabbing onto my arm. And the next thing I knew, she groaned and collapsed right next to me. And I bent down, turned her over. And the thing I'll never forget is the eyes were fixed and dilated as if they were already dead and they were not reactive to light. She was just a little thing. I'll never forget that when she, she grabbed on my arm and I went down. So now I have six paramedics working on the two people and I'm starting to think, that this isn't heart attacks. This isn't all heart. One I'll buy, but I'm not going to buy it on a 25-year-old and a 19-year-old. Something's wrong. We packaged up the patients in the two ambulances. The paramedic squad, I said, you got to come too. I don't know what we're dealing with. 
we got to the hospital, Dr. Kim came walking out and he couldn't believe it. He, they just left. They went back to their house to plan the funeral for their brother. Stanley and his wife, Teresa, were then taken to the hospital. And about this time, someone called Joseph's wife to let her know what was happening. Joseph and his wife's daughter, Monica, remembers what her mother said. And she was just screaming because I didn't know who she was really, like, talking to. And um, when she got off the phone, she said, we're going to go and pray right now. We're going to go to the bedroom and pray to Jesus and to God and ask God and Jesus to help our family because something is happening. And something was happening. Monica's uncle Adam was dead, and now her uncle Stanley and Aunt Teresa had been rushed to the hospital. So three members of the Janus family were now stricken. Adam, who had died, was the second of the three victims of these crimes. His brother Stanley was the fourth, and Stanley's wife, Teresa with an H, was the fifth victim. We now have the fourth and fifth victims of the crimes. Who was the sixth? Her name was Mary McFarland. She was 31 years old, and she worked at an Illinois Bell store. So she worked for the phone company, and yes, back then there was just one phone company. AT&T had a monopoly on phone service in America, but in 1982 it was ordered to break itself up as the result of an antitrust lawsuit, so that would be changing. Mary McFarland was a single mother with two children. The Illinois Bell store where Mary worked was in the Chicago suburb of Lombard, Illinois. At 6.45 p.m. on day one of the tragedy, Mary had just returned from having dinner with a co-worker, but she had a headache, which was common at the store because of the flickering fluorescent lights that it used, and she went into the break room. Her co-worker, Diana Hildebrand, explains, I don't know if it was even 10 minutes later, Hildebrand said. She said, I don't feel good, and she's just collapsed. We're all trying to do CPR and call 911 and all that kind of thing. The paramedics got there and they said, do you know if she took anything? I said, well, yeah, she took Tylenol. The paramedics took her to Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove, and doctors told her family that she had suffered a catastrophic stroke. At this point, the authorities didn't know that all of these deaths were connected. When did they start to put the pieces together? That same day, it started happening on the evening of day one. The first key figure in determining what was going on was Lieutenant Chuck Kramer of the fire department. He didn't know about Mary Kellerman, who had died that morning, or about Lynn Steiner, who was in the hospital, or about Mary McFarland, who was in the process of dying. But he knew about the shocking death of Adam Janus, a perfectly healthy 27-year-old, And then he was summoned to the Janus house when Adam's brother Stanley went down, Stanley being a perfectly healthy 25-year-old. And while he was there, Stanley's wife, Teresa with an H, a perfectly healthy 19-year-old, suddenly went down. So he knew of three perfectly healthy young people in the same family who were struck down on the same day, and he realized that couldn't be a coincidence. At about 7 p.m., just after Mary McFarland went down, he called a friend of his who was a nurse named Helen Jensen. Helen was at home serving dinner to her family, but she immediately went down to the hospital where she interviewed Adam's widow, Teresa, without an H, through a translator. And she heard that Adam, Stanley, and Teresa with an H had all taken Tylenol. So she went to Adam's house. What I thought, listening to the story, the only commonality between these three people was Tylenol. So in my mind, I needed to go out to prove to myself what was going on. I had to go and look at the house. That night? Yes. And I went into the bathroom and found a bottle of Tylenol, and I brought it out to the kitchen. I opened it and counted the pills and there were six pills missing and there were three people dead. And I said, it has to be the Tylenol. Specifically, what Nurse Jensen had found was a 50-pill bottle of extra-strength Tylenol, and the recommended dosage was two pills for an adult. So when Nurse Jensen counted the pills in the bottle, there were 44, leaving six pills unaccounted for. 
With two pills as the recommended dosage, that would suggest three people had taken Tylenol, and those three people would be Adam Janus, his brother Stanley Janus, and Stanley's new bride Teresa Janus. Nurse Jensen also had a police officer with her, and she had him count the pills to confirm her results, and he did. There were six pills missing from the 50. I also went through the garbage and found the receipt that this had been purchased at Jewel that morning. I went back to the emergency room, presented it to the medical examiner and the police, and they laughed at me. Because she said it very quickly. She said, it's got to be the Tylenol. They kind of looked at her like she had two heads. What do you mean the Tylenol? I'm holding it, the bottle, and the receipt. And I laid it out in front of the medical examiner, and I counted it again and told him the same thing. There are six capsules missing. There are three people dead. There has to be a correlation. No, that's fine. The Tylenol's fine. You said you stamped your foot. I did stamp my foot. These idiots wouldn't listen to me, these dumb young men who don't know beans from apple butter. I know people. I know this is what's happened. I said, this is it. This is what is causing these people to die. Find out why. They're not going to listen to me. I am a nurse, a woman in shorts. However, the doctor's impression would soon change. One of the reasons is that firefighter Chuck Kramer also spoke to another friend of his. I had a good buddy of mine, Phil Capitelli. He was also a lieutenant on the fire department, and he called. He said, Chuck, what's going on? I said, Phil, we've had a strange day. I said, we've, we've got one dead and two not doing very well at the hospital, all with the same symptoms. And I said, we, we don't know what's going on. They said, the only thing these people have in common is they all took Tylenol. He said, this morning, my mother-in-law works with a woman who lost her little girl. She was 12 years old. She had a cold. She wanted to know, how can a little girl die at 12 years old with a cold? When I got a hold of the nurse, I said, I just got a call from one of our off-duty guys. A little girl died this morning in Elk Grove, and she took Tylenol. And it's the same symptoms, rapid, shallow breathing, fixed, dilated pupils, and non-reactive. So then they believed Helen, who was saying, I think it's the Tylenol. Well, now they had it. The next thing I know is in the morning, uh, the phone rang, and they said, uh, Lieutenant, get up to headquarters station. So as soon as my relief got in, I went up, and that's when they said uh, it was the Tylenol, you know, that, uh, that they found it. So they connected 12-year-old Mary Kellerman's death to the tragedies in the Janus family, and by the next morning, they had realized that it was the Tylenol that was responsible. Other things also were happening that night. Around 8.15 p.m., Stanley Janus passed away, and his wife, Teresa with an H, was in critical condition and was seen as having no chance of recovery. And soon, the authorities figured out what was wrong with the Tylenol that was causing the problems. Helen Jensen had given the bottle from Adam Janus's house to Nick Pishos of the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office, and the Chicago Tribune explains what happened. An Elk Grove Village police officer brought the Tylenol bottle from the Kellerman home to the hospital and gave it to Nicholas Pishos, an investigator with the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. Pishos already had the bottle left by Jensen. Both bottles had the same lot number. Pishos called his boss, Dr. Edmund Donahue, Deputy Chief Medical Examiner for Cook County. Donahue, who was at home, told him to open one of the bottles and smell inside. When Pishos poured out the capsules, he caught a strong almond scent. The second bottle produced the same bitter smell. Donahue's suspicion was confirmed. He knew instantly the odor was cyanide, a notorious and rapid-acting poison that cuts off oxygen to red blood cells. The almond odor isn't always present, and even when it exists, it's discernible by only about 60% of the population. Pishos apparently was among them. As soon as I popped the top, I could smell the cyanide, Pishaw said in an interview. I remember it smells like burnt almond from my chemistry classes in college. Donahue called Michael Schaffer, the county's chief toxicologist, and asked him to come to the morgue and run tests on the confiscated Tylenol capsules. It was the first time Donahue could ever recall asking the toxicology department to work through the night. This was a crazy idea that there might be something in Tylenol, Donahue said in an interview. 
I mean, this was the world's most common analgesic. Tests would show that four of the 44 remaining capsules and the Genesis bottle contain cyanide. Records indicate each capsule had between 550 and 610 milligrams of poison, nearly three times the amount needed to kill someone. At 3.15 in the morning of Thursday, September 30th, which would be day two of the events, Mary McFarland was pronounced dead. And at 9.30 a.m. that morning, Mary Reiner was also pronounced dead. The only one of the previous day's victims who was still alive was Teresa Janus. The other five, Mary Kellerman, Adam Janus, Lynn Reiner, Stanley Janus, and Mary McFarland were now dead, and Teresa Janus was on life support. At 5.30 a.m. on day two, the news began to be reported to the public about what was happening. Details were sketchy at first, and public officials sent some mixed signals. For example, in early stages, the public was told to flush the Tylenol they had down the toilet or otherwise destroy it. This meant that they would be flushing or destroying evidence that could be used to catch whoever was responsible for the deaths, but they were so concerned to keep anyone else from dying that they initially gave a just-flush-it order. Later, they changed this and urged people to turn in the Tylenol in their possession so that it could be analyzed, which could provide clues that could lead to whoever poisoned it. They also ordered stores to pull the Tylenol from their shelves and turn it in for analysis. However, there was a dispute here also. It turned out that the victims had taken extra strength Tylenol, not regular Tylenol. And both the bottle that poisoned Mary Kellerman and the bottle that poisoned the Janus family had the same lot number. See, each bottle of over-the-counter medication is part of a particular batch of that medication, and that batch is given what's called a lot number to identify which batch it is. Well, since the Kellerman and Janus bottles had the same lot number, it was initially thought that only this one batch of extra-strength Tylenol might be affected, so initial efforts focused on that. But it soon turned out that other lot numbers were also poisoned, and out of an abundance of caution, Chicago authorities demanded the recall of all Tylenol, not just the extra-strength version. Let's take a moment to talk about the poisoning itself. You said it was caused by cyanide. What is cyanide, and what does it do? Cyanide is a type of chemical compound that has an atom of carbon, or element 6, that is triple bonded to an atom of nitrogen, or element 7. The name cyanide comes from the Greek word kuanos, which means dark blue. So yes, no matter what you've been told, they did have words for blue in ancient Greek. Kuanos was dark blue, and glaukos was light blue, for example. The idea that ancient Greek had no words for blue is a myth, and koanos is where we get the English word cyan. Cyanide occurs in nature. It's found in various fruit seeds, for example, but in very small quantities. It's also manufactured and is used in a bunch of chemical processes, so it's not illegal to have, and it's actually rather common. It's also toxic. When it gets into the human body, It bonds with the iron in a particular protein in our cells, and it disrupts the electron transport chain that cells use to make ATP for energy. So it shuts down the cell's ability to make energy to power themselves. This then manifests in symptoms like chest pain, confusion, dizziness, difficulty breathing, eye problems, coma, and death. Fortunately, there are treatments for cyanide poisoning, but these weren't as good in 1982 as they are today. We're now turning the corner from day two of the events to day three, which was Friday, October 1st, 1982. What happened on this day? At 1.15 in the afternoon, Teresa Janus was taken off life support, and she was quickly pronounced dead. All six of the victims that were known at the time were now dead but there was a seventh victim about to be discovered. Her name was Paula Prince. She was 35 years old, and she was a stewardess with United Airlines. Her co-worker, Jean Levengood, explains what happened when she went to pick up her paycheck at work that Friday. 
And they used to put our paychecks in a box on the counter, if you can believe that. And I just happened to flip through it, and I saw mine, and then I went and saw hers. And I said to the crew desk, I said, wow, I can't believe Paula didn't pick up our paychecks last night. And he said, oh, she was a no-show yesterday. I said, what do you mean she was a no-show? And I came downtown, called her sister, and told her that Paula had missed her trip yesterday. I just knew something was wrong. We went up to Paula's apartment together. Carol Prince, her sister, got there. We took the keys and went upstairs uh, and unlocked the door. And her body was on the floor. Paula had not shown up for work at United on day two, so Levengood and Paula's sister Carol went to her apartment on day three and found her on the floor. When they pieced together what happened, they discovered that after Paula returned from a flight on the evening of day one, she stopped off at a Walgreens pharmacy. At around 9.16 p.m., she bought a bottle of extra-strength Tylenol. There's even a security photo of her making the purchase, which is something because there weren't a lot of security cams back then. Paula then went home, got ready for bed, and took some of the Tylenol. So even though she wasn't found until day three, Paula was actually poisoned on day one, just like all the other victims. And fortunately, she was the seventh and last victim of this wave of poisonings. There might have been more, except for the tragic poisoning of three members of the Janus family and the fact that alerted authorities to the fact that something strange was going on. Without that cluster of poisonings, the strange deaths that were happening might have remained unconnected and more people might have died before they figured it out. But the authorities were able to realize what was happening and warn the public not to take any more Tylenol. And with the wave of deaths now mercifully over, we turn to the investigation that followed. And before we get to that investigation, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Michael H., Ethan L., Eric K., Beth M., and Paul M., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the 1982 Chicago Tylenol poisonings? A key element to the investigation would be how the cyanide got into the bottles of the extra-strength Tylenol capsules that the victims used. What are the options here? In terms of how the cyanide got into them, there are two basic options. Either it was accidental or it was intentional. There are also several places where the cyanide could have gotten in. It could have been at the factory where the Tylenol was manufactured. It could have been at the factory where the capsules were packaged. It could have been at a distributor's warehouse. It could have been when the bottles were taken to stores where they were sold. And it could have happened after the bottles were placed in the stores, but before they were sold. Then there's the question of who may have been responsible and why they did it, what their motive was. What can we say about the poisonings from the reason perspective? Could this have just been a case of accidental contamination where cyanide got into the capsules without anyone realizing that it happened? That's unlikely. Although Johnson & Johnson, the company that manufactures Tylenol, said that there was no cyanide at their manufacturing facilities, that turned out not to be true. They did use cyanide in some of their chemical processes, so there was cyanide in their factories, and hypothetically it could have accidentally gotten mixed in with other chemical ingredients when the Tylenol was being made. But that's unlikely because of the contents of the pills. Authorities ultimately found eight bottles that contained Tylenol, 
Only a few capsules in each bottle were contaminated, and those capsules contained pure cyanide with only trace amounts of Tylenol. It's not like the cyanide was mixed in with other normal ingredients. There wasn't cyanide in each of the capsules of the bottles, and there weren't varying amounts of cyanide from one capsule to another. The fact that only certain pills in each bottle were affected and that these pills contained pure cyanide without Tylenol makes this at least look deliberate, although it doesn't prove it. What about the question of where the cyanide got into the capsules? You named a bunch of possibilities all up and down the distribution chain. The authorities checked the distribution chain, but they very quickly settled on the theory that the capsules were poisoned after they had been delivered to the stores where they were sold. One of the reasons they thought that was the pattern of the poisonings. All of the victims were poisoned on the same day, day one or September 29th, and they all had Tylenol that had been bought within 24 hours. That suggested that the contaminated bottles had just been placed on store shelves. That one-day cluster meant that the bottles hadn't been sitting on the shelves for weeks or months. Most likely, they had been placed on Tuesday, September 28th, or what we could call day zero. They were probably placed at the front of the display racks, which is why they were the bottles that got selected for purchase and taken home. Furthermore, if you look at a map, the bottles were sold all over the Chicagoland area, and based on when they needed to be placed, the person who placed them would have needed to be driving all over Chicago around the afternoon of day zero. So the authorities developed the theory that an unknown citizen, who likely didn't have regular daytime employment, drove all over Chicago that afternoon and dropped off the tainted bottles at these different locations. But how could a random citizen have gotten the cyanide into the bottles when people bought them? Wouldn't it have been obvious that the bottles had been tampered with? At the time, no, it wouldn't have been. Uh, This may be a little hard for younger people in our audience to imagine, but at the time, there was no tamper-resistant packaging. Today, if you buy an over-the-counter medicine, it's going to have at least three tamper-resistant measures in place. First, the box is going to be glued shut so that you have to tear some of the cardboard to get the box open. That way, if you have a box, you can see if someone's previously torn it open and you know that someone has previously been inside the box. Second, when you take the bottle out of the box, there will be a plastic sleeve shrink-wrapped around the mouth of the bottle on top of its lid. And if you see that this seal has been torn off, you know that someone has previously had the lid off. Third, Once you take off the bottle's lid, there's going to be a foil safety seal that you have to puncture or rip off. And if you see that the bottle seal has been disturbed, you know that someone has gotten inside the bottle. There's also usually a fourth safety measure, which is when you pour out the contents of the bottle, they won't be capsules. They'll be tablets or what are called caplets, uh, neither of which can simply be opened. But none of this was true in 1982. Back then, when I was growing up, the box was not glued shut. It just had folded flaps that anybody could open and close with no sign that they'd done so. There was no shrink-wrapped seal around the mouth of the bottle. You just pop off the lid and put the lid back on without leaving a visible sign. There was no foil safety seal underneath the lid. You just opened the bottle and took out or put in whatever you wanted. And in the case of extra strength Tylenol, there were capsules. So you could just pull apart the two halves of the capsule and pour out the medicine that was inside it. That meant you could also replace the medicine from the capsule with something else, like cyanide. You could then put the two halves of the capsule back together. You could put the capsules back in the bottle. You could put the lid back on the bottle. You could put the bottle back in the box, you could close the top of the box, and you could put the box back on a shelf in a store, and there would be no sign to another person that you had done any of this. The safety measures that we have today simply weren't being used back then, and the reason they came to be used was precisely because of the 1982 Tylenol poisonings. How did the modern safety measures come about? 
Well, even before the Tylenol murders, people had been tampering with capsules. In fact, Johnson & Johnson had something like 300 complaints of product tampering in the period leading up to the Tylenol murders, so they'd already been thinking about safety measures. And then once seven people suddenly dropped dead all at once because of product tampering, they realized that they had a huge problem. Tylenol had been pulled off the market in Chicago, and they had an enormous public relations disaster. So they announced that within like a month, they would start implementing tamper-resistant measures to reassure the public and keep this kind of thing from happening again. And when Tylenol was put back on the market a few weeks later, it had new tamper-resistant measures on it. These measures were quickly adopted by other drug makers, and now they're universal in the United States on over-the-counter medications. That would have been reassuring, but didn't the new measures also frustrate people who had never had to go through them before when they wanted to get to their medicine? They did get frustrated. Uh, Ripping open the box isn't too difficult for most adults, but getting that shrink-wrapped seal off the mouth of the bottle can be, and getting through the foil under seal also can be. And this is worse if you're older and have arthritis or other problems with your fingers. I remember at the time watching a late-night comedy show that had a sketch that parodied the situation. In the sketch, it was framed in the form of a helpful public service announcement from a drug company explaining how to get through all the new safety measures. In a voiceover, a company spokesman was narrating a hapless customer through the process. Only the safety measures were turned up to 11, so the person was having to dial a rotary combination lock to get into the bottle, and then they had to enter a personal numeric code on a pin pad and things like that. But the new tamper-resistant measures stuck, and they helped Johnson & Johnson's Tylenol brand, which had been the most popular pain reliever, to bounce back. Uh, There had been a real question about whether it would be able to do so, and many people at the time thought they'd never be able to market anything under the name Tylenol again. But the new safety measures helped convince people otherwise. However, all that was still in the future. At the time the poisonings occurred, there was basically nothing stopping a person buying a bottle of Tylenol from replacing the drug inside the capsules with cyanide and then returning the bottle to the store. Did the authorities start getting leads about who that might have been? They did. Uh, As always, the public started sending in a huge number of tips about who might be responsible, and as always, law enforcement had to follow them up, even if they didn't think they were promising. For example, here's a news report in which Illinois Attorney General Tyrone Fainer discusses one tip. As for the investigation into the murders, state authorities have no shortage of tips from the public. Problem, says Attorney General Fainer, is that some of those tips are misleading. We had a lady the other day, to help you understand, who called in and gave information that was highly credible and made sense, and we quickly dispatched two agents thinking we could have solved this crime. She said she had definite information, and it all made sense. We got there, we said, now where did you get this information? And she says, I have a magic pen, and it made me write these things out, and I've told you about it. Now, if I brought that out to you, uh, you'd be disturbed, and I would be too. So in this case, Attorney General Fainer says that a woman used a psychic practice known as automatic writing to get information about the crime. And even though he said the information made sense and was highly credible, he dismissed it. However, other law enforcement officials have been open to working with psychics, as we heard back in episode 264 on Psychic Detectives, where remote viewer Pam Coronado told us about her extensive work with law enforcement agencies. Were the authorities able to develop any leads that they regarded as credible? Law enforcement's often able to develop leads if they can determine the motive for a crime. Were they able to tell anything about the motive here? Except for the members of the Janus family, who all took capsules from the same bottle, the victims seem to be completely unrelated. Though that doesn't preclude the idea that one of the victims was deliberately targeted, as we'll hear later. At least on the face of it, the victims didn't look like they'd been deliberately targeted, which would suggest the the motive had to do with something other than the victims. One possibility would be that it was someone with a grudge against the business where the capsules were bought. For example, the Kellerman bottle and the Janus bottle had both been bought at a grocery store called Jewel Food, so maybe it was someone with a grudge against Jewel Food. 
And on November 1st, just over a month after the poisonings, one such person came to light. His name was Kevin Masterson, and according to the Chicago Tribune, investigators had said that he had a grudge against Jewel Food. In fact, he allegedly told friends back in September that now is the time to even the score. In his book, Timers, the 1982 Tylenol Murders, Scott Bartz writes, An affidavit filed in the 18th Circuit Court in DuPage County said Masterson's anger toward Jewel arose from an incident in which his former wife, Joanne, felt Jewel's security officers had mistreated her after holding her for suspected shoplifting. Jane Armstrong, a vice president at Jewel, confirmed that the woman filed a civil suit against Jewel in 1975 and that a settlement was reached four years later. Armstrong refused to give details about the suit, but the Chicago Tribune said Mrs. Masterson had settled for $8,000. In fact, Kevin Masterson blamed the Jewel incident as leading to his divorce from his wife. However, this didn't conclusively link him to the poisonings. Bartz continues, Even the feds refused to call Kevin Masterson a suspect. A Washington-based law enforcement source who asked not to be identified told the Chicago Tribune, There's still nothing to indicate Masterson is anything other than a guy with a big mouth. There are some questions to ask him, but it would take a quantum leap from what is known to connect him to the Tylenol killings. At the time, Masterson was out in California, but he turned himself in, and after the authorities had a chance to question him, they eliminated him as a suspect, so they continued to look for other people. There are also other problems with the idea that Jewel Food was the target of the poisonings. Two bottles had been bought at Jewel Food stores, but the McFarland bottle and the Prince bottle had been bought at Walgreens. The Reiner bottle was purchased at a store called Frank's Finer Foods. There also was another poison bottle that got turned in that had been purchased from Frank's Finer Foods, and one bottle was purchased at Osco Drugs. So it didn't look like one company was being targeted. It didn't even look like one type of store was being targeted, since some of these were grocery stores and some were pharmacies. What about targeting Johnson & Johnson, the makers of Tylenol? This was and is a possibility. Since the only cyanide-laced product was extra-strength Tylenol, it had been speculated that the poisoner might have some kind of grudge against Johnson & Johnson or its subsidiary McNeil Laboratories, which manufactures Tylenol. However, this wasn't enough to get a good lead on individual suspects. Were they able to identify other suspects? Yes, one emerged after the incident on day 11. Scott Bartz reports, On Saturday evening, October 9, 1982, Roger Arnold, a 48-year-old wiry chain-smoking warehouse worker, stopped off for a few drinks at O'Rourke's Tavern, an Irish pub located in Lincoln Park on Chicago's north side. Arnold entered the tavern carrying a plastic bag of white powder that he said was cyanide. He then allegedly made comments about killing people with cyanide. The tavern's owner, Marty Sinclair, picked up the phone and called the Chicago police. He told them Arnold was a peculiar bird who kept test tubes, guns, and two vials of cyanide in his house. Two days later, Arnold was in Lily's Bar down the street from O'Rourke's Tavern. When Chicago police detectives entered the bar and picked up Arnold on an outstanding arrest warrant for aggravated assault. With Arnold's permission, the police searched his house on Chicago's south side. They confiscated one bolt-action rifle, four handguns, and a stockpile of ammunition. Chicago police arrested Arnold and charged them with failing to register the weapons and on the prior charge of aggravated assault. Arnold was held without bail so he could be questioned about the Tylenol murders. What's more, Arnold also had a connection to Jewel Food. In 1969, Arnold took a job as a warehouse worker for Jewel Companies and was still employed there when he became a suspect in the Tylenol murders case. Arnold was a foreman and union steward in Jewel's salvage operation at the company's Melrose Park distribution facility. Arnold was also something of an amateur chemist, and though he initially denied having any cyanide, He later admitted that he had previously had some that he used for experiments. He said that he had gotten rid of it in August, over a month before the murders, but authorities found some interesting things when they searched his house. While searching Arnold's house, investigators found two one-way tickets to Thailand. 
They confiscated a number of books and magazines, including a stash of Soldier of Fortune magazines, the anarchist cookbook of recipes for making explosive devices, and the poor man's James Bond, a handbook written by right-wing survivalist and former Minuteman Kurt Saxon, a.k.a. Donald Sisko. Police confiscated several training manuals published in the mid-1960s by the United States Department of Defense for use by U.S. Army Special Forces. These training manuals included incendiaries, booby traps, unconventional warfare, devices and techniques, and military chemistry and chemical agents. Police found lab equipment in various chemicals, including large quantities of a particular type of hair gel used in some of the bomb-making recipes found in the anarchist cookbook. Police also turned up a suspicious-looking plastic bag of white powder and a book with instructions for encapsulating cyanide. The white powder was turned over to the Chicago Health Department laboratory. A spokesperson for the Chicago police later said a lab test found that the powder was a harmless carbonate. Arnold was held without bond while city detectives followed up on the circumstantial evidence that led them to consider him a possible suspect in the Tylenol poisonings. Lieutenant Lacallo said a series of coincidences had surfaced when Arnold talked with investigators, and they had no choice but to investigate further. The press reported these coincidences were that Arnold told police he had kept cyanide at his house until August, that he had allegedly threatened to kill his estranged wife with cyanide capsules. He worked at a warehouse that officials said was a distribution point for some of the poison Tylenol, and he worked with the father of one of the Tylenol victims. Furthermore, Marty Sinclair was not the only tavern owner who heard Arnold talk about poisoning people with cyanide. According to the Daily Herald, Arnold reportedly told several Chicago tavern owners rambling stories about killing people with cyanide. Despite all this, they didn't have the kind of evidence they need to charge him with the crimes, and so Roger Arnold was eventually released on bond, but the police kept him under constant surveillance. While the police were watching Arnold, were there other suspects that were they were considering? Yes, and you'll recall that I said earlier, even though the victims looked like a random group of people, it was still possible that one of them was targeted. This is because if you want to kill someone that's close to you, you don't want to immediately become a suspect, which is what tends to happen when someone dies, the police immediately look at those who are close to them as possible suspects. So if a killer wants to off someone, he may want to randomly off some other people too. That way, the person he wants to kill looks like one more random victim. Back in episode 263 on the DC Beltway Snipers, we talked about that. One of the speculations that some people had was that John Muhammad may have wanted to kill his estranged ex-wife, but he wanted to kill other people randomly first so that his ex-wife's death would look like part of a larger random pattern, only they caught him before he got around to killing her. I don't know that that was at all Muhammad's motive. Uh, it wasn't what he and Lee Boyd Malvo said, but it is something that a murderer might do, and law enforcement officials know that. So despite the seemingly random nature of the killings, they started looking at the relatives of the victims as potential suspects, and they identified two. You'll recall that the third victim was a woman named Lynn Reiner, who had just come home from the hospital after having her fourth child a few days earlier, and her husband, Ed, was just getting home when she fell victim to the cyanide. The authorities noticed something else. Lynn's father, a man named Howard Fearon, also worked at Jewel Food, just like Roger Arnold did. So they put together a theory. According to this theory, Lynn Reiner was the real target of the killings. All the others were just misdirection to keep the authorities from looking too closely at those near Lynn. And the people who actually killed her was a conspiracy of three men. Her husband, Ed Reiner, her father, Howard Fearon, who worked at Jewel, and Roger Arnold, who also worked at Jewel. So, in addition to questioning Roger Arnold, the authorities also pulled in Howard Fearon and Ed Reiner and questioned them, too. Here's what happened when they questioned Ed. A sense of foreboding grew in Reiner's mind. He was rightfully apprehensive that his name was going to be plastered all over the media as the prime suspect. 
Several hours into the interrogation, the time was right to give Reiner a way out of his predicament. The interrogators offered Reiner the same deal they had given his father-in-law the previous day. One of the interrogators told Reiner that if he was innocent, he could prove it by passing a lie detector test. To the consternation of his attorney, Reiner agreed to take a polygraph exam, but he wanted the results made public right away. Polygraph exams cannot produce evidence or solve crimes, but they are an applicable psychological weapon used by investigators to get confessions, sometimes false confessions. They were the primary investigative tool used by the members of the Tylenol task force who put many relatives of the Tylenol victims on the suspect list. The only way these relatives could get off that list was to take a polygraph exam. Law enforcement officials who had conducted an inept investigation were thus using polygraph exams because they had turned up no good leads. It was out of pure desperation that investigators from the FBI and IDOL interrogated Ed Reiner and accused him of being the ringleader of a Tylenol murder conspiracy. After the grilling Reiner received from his interrogators, he probably was not in a very good state of mind to take a test designed to measure his level of anxiety. Nevertheless, Reiner knew that the allegations were ludicrous and he wanted to put an end to them. Now, we talked about lie detectors back in episode 130 on polygraph machines, and they do not reliably detect lies, which is one reason that their results are not admissible as evidence of guilt in court. You should listen to episode 130 for more information, and that will also cover why you should never agree to take a lie detector test unless you are legally required to do so, like for a security clearance. But Ed Reiner took one, and he passed. Its results, its results indicated that he was being truthful when he said he had not murdered his wife or other people. Because it's possible to fool a lie detector, that doesn't prove he didn't do it, but it did make it hard for law enforcement. And there were other problems with this theory as well, really big problems, and we'll only cover some of them. One is that the whole conspiracy idea is implausible to begin with. If you say that Roger Arnold was a crazy man who wanted to kill people with cyanide, how do you explain both Lynn's husband and her father agreeing to kill her? On rare occasions, husbands may want to kill their wives or vice versa, but it's even more rare for fathers to want to kill their adult daughters who no longer live with them. So the idea of both Lynn's husband and her father being in on the plot to kill her is extremely unlikely to be the case. Then there's the fact that although they both worked for Jewel, Roger Arnold and Howard Fearon didn't work together and they didn't even know each other. Then the authorities would need to explain how Ed managed to poison Lynn because she had gone to a Frank's Finer Foods and bought a bottle of regular strength Tylenol the day she died. It wasn't Ed who bought the bottle, it was Lynn herself. So law enforcement had to propose that Ed somehow knew his wife would be going to Frank's Finer Foods to buy Tylenol, and so he went there first and planted the bottle for her to purchase? But that's really implausible, because the bottle would have been on a rack of other bottles, and how did Frank know which bottle she would pick? As video footage of the time reveals, such racks typically had rows of at least six bottles in a line. So even if Frank put the bottle on the first row, there would only be a one in six chance of Lynn purchasing it. And there were other problems with this theory, one of which we'll cover later. However, suffice it to say that the case against Ed Reiner and Howard Fearon completely fell apart. What about Roger Arnold? What happened with him? Well, something interesting happened the next year in the summer of 1983, as made clear in this news story from January of 1984. The jury found Roger Arnold guilty of murdering a man outside a Lincoln Avenue bar. Prosecutors said he had mistaken the victim for the North Side bar owner who gave Arnold's name to police as a possible suspect in the Tylenol killings. The man Arnold shot was 46-year-old John Stanisha, a computer salesman and father of three. 
Prosecutors argue that Arnold shot Stanisha after mistaking him for another heavy-set bearded man who testified in court today. When Arnold took the witness stand, he said he bought a 45 caliber handgun to protect himself. Shortly before the verdict tonight, a clean-shaven Arnold said he became the victim of the suspicion that surrounded him ever since he was questioned and released in the October 1982 investigation. Could you elaborate for us why you consider yourself a victim? Because I am going to end up one way or the other in prison because of this thing. I was not in my right state of mind when this happened. I wouldn't have a gun with me unless I was afraid that somebody was going to get me. Tonight's verdict brings investigators no closer to solving the Tylenol cyanide killings. But for Roger Arnold, the consequences are serious. The murder conviction carries a penalty of up to 40 years in prison. Sentencing is scheduled for Valentine's Day. Arnold was then sent sentenced to 30 years in prison, and he ended up serving 15 years of that. So he was released around 1999. He definitely did kill John Stanisha outside of the bar, but there are disputes about why this happened. According to prosecutors, he mistook Stanisha for Marty Sinclair, who was the bartender that initially reported him to the police, so it was a revenge killing. But Arnold's account is different. He says that he was carrying a gun because he was afraid that someone would attack him as a result of all the media attention on him as a suspect in the Tylenol killings. He was thus in a highly agitated state of mind, fearing for his life. He got into a dispute with Stanisha in front of the bar, and the gun went off accidentally. I don't know if that's what happened, but Arnold apparently talked with Stanisha for a period of time, and that would suggest that he didn't mistake Stanisha for Sinclair and knew he was a different person. However that may be, in 1996, while he was still in prison, Arnold stated, I killed a man, a perfectly innocent person. I had choices. I could have walked away. So it's good that he took responsibility for his actions. He passed on to his reward in 2008. Were there any other major suspects in the case? There were, and the last major suspect began to develop after an event on Day 8, or October 6, 1982. On that day, Johnson & Johnson's executive committee learned about a handwritten letter that read, Johnson & Johnson, parent of McNeil Laboratories. Gentlemen, as you can see, it is easy to place cyanide, both potassium and sodium, into capsules sitting on store shelves. And since the cyanide is inside the gelatin, it is easy to get buyers to swallow the bitter pill. Another beauty is that cyanide operates quickly. It takes so very little. And there will be no time to take countermeasures. If you don't mind the publicity of these little capsules, then do nothing. So far, I have spent less than $50. And it takes me less than 10 minutes per bottle. If you want to stop the killing, then wire $1 million to bank account 8449597 at Continental Illinois Bank, Chicago, Illinois. Don't attempt to involve the FBI or local Chicago authorities with this letter. A couple of phone calls by me will undo anything you can possibly do. So this was a letter attempting to extort a million dollars out of Johnson & Johnson, or $3.2 million after all the inflation the government has caused. That would be a new motive, one that we haven't discussed before. Money. Well, despite the warning not to involve the authorities, the Johnson & Johnson executives did. However, as Scott Bartz writes, It was immediately apparent that the authorities did not believe that the extortion letter was relevant to the actual Tylenol poisonings. It's a long shot that this is the work of anything other than a kook, said a law enforcement source in Washington. The killings were a very subtle and secretive crime, and it's doubtful that would be topped off with a flagrant ignorance of delivering a payoff scheme with the identity attached to it, the source added. Our guess is it's totally unrelated to whoever did the poisoning. These tagalongs happen all the time. Attorney General Tyrone Fainer downplayed the significance of the extortion letter, saying, It will not be relevant in solving the cyanide murders. It is a whole side issue, a hoax. Fainer said the disclosure of the letter was unfortunate because it sidetracked the investigators. However, they did check out the letter, and they found several things that were interesting about it. 
First, it had been mailed in an envelope that had been franked with a Pitney Bowes postage meter belonging to a company called the Lakeside Travel Agency, which had been owned by a man named Frederick McCahey. Second, the bank account that the money was to be wired to was an account belonging to Frederick McCahey. And third, both Lakeside Travel and the bank account had been closed. The travel agency was no longer in business, and the bank and with the bank account closed, there was no way to wire a million dollars into it. So authorities quickly realized that Mr. McCahey was not actually trying to get a million dollars from Johnson & Johnson. Instead, this looked like a clumsy attempt to frame Mr. McCahey. So they asked him who might have a grudge against him, and he mentioned a married couple named Robert and Nancy Richardson. Only those weren't their real names. It turned out that they had a huge number of aliases. They also were known as William and Karen Wagner and Edward and Carol Scott. Robert Richardson was also known as David E. Woods, John Ryan, Robert Myers, Raymond Thompson, Robert Johnson, and Theodore Elmer Wilson. According to one report, he had 17 aliases. Not like there's anything suspicious about that. But the couple's true names were James and Leanne Lewis. And law enforcement found out why they had a grudge against Mr. McCahey. Scott Bratz reports, In December 1981, using the names Robert and Nancy Richardson, they moved into a $100 a month apartment at 549 West Belden Avenue on Chicago's north side. In January 1982, Leanne took an accounting job at Lakeside Travel Agency. By March of that same year, Leanne could see that Lakeside was in financial trouble. The company had been taken over a year earlier by Frederick Miller McCahey, an heir to the Miller Brewing fortune. Leanne's supervisor, Barbara Veitkes, later testified that co-workers gossiped about McCahey having put other enterprises out of business. Veitkes said she had discovered evidence that McCahey had diverted company funds to pay his personal bills and was not properly depositing Lakeside's receipts. In April, the First National Bank of Chicago hired Jim as a temporary employee in its international department. In that same month, Lakeside Travel went bankrupt. On Leanne's last day at the company, she stamped a stack of blank envelopes with postage from a Pitney Bowes meter and a postmark date of April 15, 1982. The following week, Vitkus issued 18 final paychecks that totaled about $8,000, or $26,000 today, including Leanne's check for $511, or $1,600 today. Leanne cashed that check at a nearby currency exchange store. The check bounced, and the currency exchange then sued Leanne to recover the funds. All of the other final paychecks from Lakeside also bounced. The majority of the former Lakeside employees filed claims with the Illinois Department of Labor in an attempt to collect on the dishonored checks. Mr. Lewis volunteered his time to work as their advocate. In preparation for the coming wage claim hearing, Lewis gathered as much information as he could find on Lakeside travel. The wage hearing was held in August 1982. Frederick McCahey's lawyer attended the hearing, but McCahey did not. Forty-five minutes after the hearing ended, the arbitrator ruled that because there was no money available to pay a claim, there was nothing he could do about the bounce checks. McCahey's attorney left the hearing, and shortly thereafter, McCahey himself arrived. An argument ensued between McCahey and the Lewises. The exchange ended with McCahey threatening Leanne. Jim's temporary job ended in August 1982, and the Lewises, both now unemployed, decided to move on. So that was the month before the Tylenol killings happened. Authorities also thought that they may have discovered a piece of evidence more directly linking James Lewis to the Tylenol poisonings. You'll recall that there was a security photo of Paula Prince in the act of buying the extra strength Tylenol that killed her. Well, in the background of that photo, between 10 and 20 feet behind her, was a bearded man who looked a good bit like James Lewis. If this man was James Lewis, then that would put him at the site where the poison Tylenol was sold on the day that it was sold. 
Did the authorities ever determine that the man in the photo was James Lewis? No. Uh, People who knew Lewis looked at the photo and said it wasn't him. This was further backed up by biometric measurements that indicated the two men's body builds were different, so it wasn't him. However, by this point, the authorities had begun thinking of Lewis as a suspect, so they started to look for James and Leanne Lewis, beginning a nationwide manhunt. And word got round to the Lewises that the authorities were looking for them. But they didn't turn themselves in. Instead, James Lewis sent a note to the authorities. According to the paper's Sunday edition, the note was included along with other materials from James Lewis in Friday's mail. In the note, fugitive James Lewis says neither he nor his wife are responsible for the seven cyanide murders. The note says, as you have probably guessed, my wife and I have not committed the Chicago area Tylenol murders. We do not go around killing people. We never have and we never shall. The paper says the envelope the note came in had a New York City postmark, suggesting the Lewis couple might still be in New York, where they were last seen October 14th at this Midtown Hotel. Today, Illinois Attorney General Tyrone Fainer said he had no doubt that the note was authentic. He had a message for Lewis. We'd like you to consider turning yourself in. It's our feeling that if you continue to run, you'll be caught in any event. I can understand your running if indeed you are responsible for the terrible cyanide murders, but if your letter to us is true, that is all the more reason for you to turn yourself in. If you are indeed innocent, we will help you prove it. If you are innocent, your continued hiding is pointless. We'd like you to consider that since you've become a very prolific writer. Whether or not Lewis accepts the Attorney General's invitation remains to be seen. In the meantime, officials say they'll intensify their search for the Lewis couple on the East Coast. I don't buy for a minute the idea that the authorities were going to help Lewis prove that he was innocent. They were thinking of him as a suspect, and once authorities suspect you, they are interested in proving you are guilty, not that you're not guilty. So I can't really blame Lewis for not turning himself in, or at least not without getting a lawyer, because as we've covered in previous episodes, if law enforcement suspects you of committing a crime, you should never, ever, under any circumstances, talk to the police without a lawyer. And if they catch you and want to talk to you, the first thing you say is that you need to speak to an attorney before answering any questions. However, the authorities were looking for the Lewises, particularly in New York, uh, they wanted. They put out uh, images of what James Lewis would look like uh, without a beard, and they got a hit. Scott Bartz reports. On the afternoon of December 13th, librarian Donald Alexis was working at the New York Public Library Annex at 40th Street and 5th Avenue when Lewis approached him at the fourth floor reference desk. Lewis told Alexis that he had found a library book with a broken binding. I just glanced up at him, Alexis said and in a flash, something seemed familiar. Alexis went into the staff room and took another look at the FBI poster tacked up on the bulletin board. He then called the phone number printed on the poster. Special Agent Vincent Piazza answered the call at the FBI office in Manhattan. There's a lookalike of Mr. Lewis here, Alexis told Piazza. After lunch today, Monday, we received a telephone call at the New York FBI office that an individual answering the description of James Lewis, as set forth in his wanted poster, was at the New York Public Library on 40th Street and 5th Avenue. We sent agents up there. They located the man, placed him under arrest, brought him down here. Chicago detectives flew out of O'Hare tonight for New York to question James Lewis not just about extortion, but about the Tylenol murders as well. He is high uh, on our list of people that we have to determine whether or not he's responsible. Lewis has denied any role in the poisoning of seven Chicago area residents in late September. It is I love my country, America. I have a deep and abiding respect for the law. I love my wife, Leanne. I love her very much. Authorities had established that Lewis and his wife were registered at a New York hotel at the time of the murders in Chicago but investigators now are checking airline records between the two cities. In other words, where was Lewis when poison was placed on the shelves of this store where Tylenol victim Paul Apprentice shopped and on the shelves of other stores, resulting in seven deaths? That is the question authorities want answered. 
In custody, Lewis continued to insist that he had nothing to do with the Tylenol murders. He did admit to writing the letter, but he argued that it actually didn't count as extortion because he had no intention of gaining a million dollars by it. It wasn't his bank account that the letter said to put the money in, and in fact, nobody had access to that bank account, not even Mr. McKay, because it was closed. Instead, he maintained that the letter was meant to draw attention from law enforcement to Mr. McKay because of his shady financial practices, including stiffing his employees by writing bad checks as their final paychecks. However, the authorities didn't believe him, and they continued to think that he was the Tylenol killer. They encouraged him to envision scenarios about how the Tylenol killer might have gone about his evil task. You know, uh, hey, uh, you say that you're innocent, so help us prove it. Uh, how do you think? the Tylenol killer might have operated. You know, give us a plausible idea that we can investigate and we may be able to find the real guy. But instead of using these suggestions to find someone else as the killer and thus prove Lewis innocent, they instead used these conversations at trial as evidence that Lewis was involved. The authorities still had no evidence linking Lewis to the poisonings themselves, though, so they settled for charging him with writing an extortion letter, and Lewis was convicted. Here's an interview Lewis gave on September 15, 1984, two years after the poisonings and after he was convicted. It's a few minutes long, but it's worth listening to so you can get a sense of the guy. For the moment, he is one of 384 prisoners at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in the Loop. One day soon, he will likely be ordered to serve his prison term, which now totals 20 years, in some other federal prison. He is 37-year-old James Lewis, the man convicted of writing the notorious Tylenol extortion letter, then running from the law during a nationwide manhunt until his arrest in New York City in December of 1982. What was it like to be on the run, knowing that every law enforcement agency in the country was looking for you? It is terrifying absolutely terrifying. Can you imagine trying to tell your wife that, honey, I, uh, I wrote a letter. Uh, oh yeah? Well, there's something else I need to tell you. The, uh, they're talking about it in the radio and on TV. <laughs> go on, go on. Just trying to explain that to your wife. How it's, did she take that? She, uh, just sat and stared at the wall for a while. How could you have done such a thing? So then you found yourselves running from the law. Didn't really run that much. We just moved to another hotel and uh, just a few blocks away and uh, didn't really hide. We were out on the streets in New York every day. Uh, for example, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Macy's uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade at Herald Square, there were about 400 policemen uh, standing waiting to get their orders on where they were going to be stationed. My wife and I walked hand in hand through all of those people at the time that this big manhunt was going on. We did not hide. As he did one, throughout his trial, Lewis says he wrote the letter only to focus attention on his now, wife's but, uh, former employer, a, a Lewis suspected of financial the wrongdoing. In that letter, Somebody Lewis had asked that one million dollars be placed in the man's enough. bank account. Yeah, okay. The letter itself is not illegal unless you have the intent, and there is no way that I could have possibly had any intent there. The bank account was a closed bank account. It was at Continental Illinois Bank. Uh, I had no more access to that bank account than one of you gentlemen here. Don't you feel you exploited a lot of people's fears and made worse an already near hysterical situation with all of those poisoning deaths? It was not my intention to do that, number one. Number two, I did not release that letter to the public. The FBI released that letter to the public and injected it into that situation with the public. Lewis feels he was convicted because U.S. Attorney Dan Webb led the jury in the case to connect him with the Tylenol murders, not merely the letter. Not only talked about each and every one of the the homicides, he also came up with hypothetical homicides, and uh, it was almost as if he had rhetorically hurled each one of those bodies at each of the jurors. Uh, 
you could really see the fear on the juror's face when uh, he was going through his closing argument. And he talked very little about the piece of paper. Did you feel then that you were on trial for the Tylenol murders? I did. Did you commit the Tylenol murders? I did not. Do you know who did? I, <clears throat> I do not know who did, no. What do you want to say to the people of Chicago, and to the country for that matter? Uh, how should they look upon James Lewis? How should they view you today? I think that is something that you're going to have to take a while to look at. I've been subjected to an awful lot of, of uh, statements in the press by government and a lot of other people. It is very, very difficult to overcome that much in the way of hostile statements. I have been the officially designated evil one by the by the Justice Department, when one gains that status, if there is such a thing as a status, it's a horrible status to have, when one is the focus of that much hatred, it is virtually impossible for a person to convince very many people that uh, he is not as he has been described. It will take a while, and uh, uh, I am working on that, and I will keep working on that, and I will keep fighting on that for as long as I can. Even though Lewis was now locked up, he hadn't been jailed for the Tylenol killing, so that case was officially still open, and law enforcement was still looking at it. Meanwhile, in prison, Lewis found himself with a lot of time on his hands, and if he helped find the real killer, it might help him in some way, like getting him out of prison sooner. So he contacted the authorities and said he'd be willing to help them find the real killer. Here's former U.S. Attorney Jeremy Margolis explaining one idea that Lewis came up with for how the killer might have gotten cyanide into the capsules. It involves drilling holes in a board and then putting the bottom halves of the capsules into the holes. This is his uh, drilled board method, his words, not mine, where you drill these holes into this little plywood contraption, put the bottom capsule uh, into this hole, uh, put a mound of cyanide on top of the board, scrape it across with a bread knife, uh, clean up the excess, put the tops of the capsules in, load them into the cyan uh, into the Tylenol bottles, and put them uh, on the store shelves. So he drew that? He drew that. Uh, this is a, a, a photocopy of his original drawing. Uh, he speculated, hypothesized, on how the killings might have taken place. What were you thinking when he first gave you that? bizarre, to put it mildly. He spent uh, a great deal of time, many, many hours, thinking, ruminating, and preparing these manuscripts and these drawings. But he was always very careful to explain that this was speculation. These were all hypotheticals. These were uh, merely his uh, musings uh, to try to give us investigative ideas that might lead to finding the Tylenol killer. And this was just one method that Lewis came up with. We'll have a link to where you can see some of the drawings he made for what he was suggesting that law enforcement officials look into. And if he was innocent, it's a good thing that he was always careful to say he was just speculating on what might have happened. Because you could hear how Margolis found Lewis's actions bizarre, to say the least. If Lewis had ever failed to clearly state that he was only speculating, law enforcement could have taken that as an admission of guilt, and then they would have put him on trial for the seven murders. They were already thinking that even though he was giving them multiple different scenarios, that they were really evidence of his involvement. They believed that Lewis had been excited by the murders in their aftermath, and that now he was now that he was cooling his heels, in prison he was less excited, even bored. So to increase his excitement level, he would offer the authorities help in finding the killer and feed them tantalizing stories, some of which were confessions of what he actually did, but disguised as speculations. Kind of like what happened with O.J. Simpson after the deaths of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. Simpson had been found not guilty in criminal court, but then he was found liable for the murders in civil court. And in 2007, Simpson came out with a book titled If I Did It, 
which featured a chapter describing what could have happened if Simpson had been Nicole and Ron's killer. The book was widely understood as a crypto confession, an impression that was furthered by the fact that the publisher put the word if in white type and I did it in blood red type. That was all still in the future, but authorities thought that James Lewis was doing the same kind of thing with them. What happened with the case in later years? Well, Lewis remained their prime suspect in the case, and many officials thought that he was the one who did it. But they never got either a confession or hard evidence showing this, so he was never charged. The case continued to be of interest to the public. For example, last year, in 2023, Netflix released a five-part documentary called Painkiller, The Tylenol Murders. And in it, they interview numerous officials who say they think Lewis was the one. But And they even had a reporter track Lewis down at his residence to try to interview him, but he said he wasn't Lewis because he didn't want to talk to them. Nevertheless, it's very clear that the theory that Lewis was the guy is strongly preferred by the makers of Painkiller. However, if Lewis was the killer, he won't be prosecuted in an earthly court for the crimes. Breaking news, the prime suspect in the infamous Tylenol murders has died. Police in Cambridge, Massachusetts confirmed they found 76-year-old James Lewis dead in his home overnight. Investigators do not consider his death to be suspicious. The Tylenol killings shocked the Chicago area and entire country back in 1982. Seven people were poisoned to death by taking the over-the-counter pain medicine, which had been laced with cyanide. Lewis is the only person to ever be convicted in connection with the murders. He was arrested in 1982 after trying to extort $1 million from Johnson & Johnson. Lewis has long been at the center of the investigation, but has always maintained his innocence. On Sunday, July 9th, 2023, James Lewis passed on to his reward. He was found dead at his home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was 76 years old, and authorities determined that there was no sign of foul play. If he was the killer, some justice was done by his prison term for writing the letter to Johnson & Johnson, and further justice could be expected from the transfer of his case to a higher heavenly court. I know a lot of people think that James Lewis was the killer, but what do you think, Jimmy? Did he do it? Well, James Lewis certainly was not the completely innocent guy that he portrayed himself to be. Not only did he use more than a dozen aliases in his life, uh, there's a lot more to his history, as we can see by considering some of the evidence that was presented at his trial. Lewis was convicted only of writing an extortion letter to Johnson & Johnson, the makers of the painkiller. During his presentation to the judge, U.S. Attorney Dan Webb asked that the convicted extortionist be given the maximum 20 years, calling Lewis a walking crime wave. Webb claimed that Lewis had attacked and tried to kill his parents in 1966 and said there is evidence linking Lewis to a dismemberment murder in Kansas City in 1978. As for the extortion letter, Webb called it evil and depraved. Lewis, acting as his own attorney, launched into an hour-long rambling defense of his record. The Justice Department wants to show, Lewis said, that I am a criminal genius. That is not the case. He went on, I do not lie, I do not cheat, I do not steal. Said Judge McGar, in the face of two felony convictions, that is a pretty hollow claim. Then the sentence. Ten years in federal prison. I have uh, great confidence in Judge McGar's discretion. I believe that the uh, the sentence that was imposed of a ten-year consecutive sentence is, is a very fair sentence. I'm very pleased with the sentence. But Webb also said the question of Lewis's possible involvement in the Tylenol killings has not been cleared up to his satisfaction. I, I cannot eradicate the fact that he sent the letter itself which confessed the Tylenol murders. I can't take away the fact that he has a bizarre background. I can't take away the fact that in certain interviews that I revealed in court today, in which Mr. Lewis, in effect, uh, started to discuss how these murders might have been conducted, in which he went into elaborate detail. When you put all of those together, I am not about to sit here and say that he's no longer a suspect. Now, we've heard some of that evidence before, as well as James Lewis's perspective on it. But let's take a look at what we haven't considered up to now, at Lewis's life before the Tylenol killings. Writing for the Chicago Reader, Joy Bergman explains, Life started rough for James Lewis. 
Born in Memphis in 1946, he was the only son of migrant workers Theodore and Opal Wilson. In 1948, while the family lingered in Waco, Theodore skipped town. Months later, Opal left her toddler and two daughters, seven and nine, to fend for themselves in a transient motel outside Joplin, Missouri. After a few days, social workers discovered the brood and split up the siblings. Joplin's Big Brothers Agency took charge of little Theodore and granted custody of the three-year-old to Floyd and Charlotte Lewis, a childless couple from nearby Cave Junction, who renamed him James William Lewis. He was in a lot of trouble, a very mixed-up boy, said Lewis's cousin Lucille Mallet in a 1982 interview. He always did things that ordinary people wouldn't. My aunt tried to give him back to Big Brothers because she couldn't handle him, but they wouldn't take him back. Floyd Lewis died of a stroke when Jim was 12. For the next five years, Charlotte and her son lived alone in the home without plumbing or electricity. In 1964, she married Glenn Nelson, a groundskeeper at the local golf course. But problems with the teenage Jim so frightened Charlotte, she slept with a gun under her pillow. A double life was emerging. At school, Lewis made good grades, played trombone in the marching band, and worked on the yearbook. At home, he raged. When he was 19, Lewis reportedly chased his mother with an axe and was charged with assaulting his stepfather, breaking several ribs in a beating. Lewis overdosed on 36 Anison tablets and was committed to a Missouri State Mental Hospital in 1966 with a diagnosis of catatonic schizophrenia. He later tried to explain the apparent suicide attempt and his brutality against his parents as an elaborate plan the family had hatched so he could avoid the Vietnam draft. So that explains the 1966 attempt to kill his parents that we heard about at James's trial. He said that it was part of an elaborate plan to evade the Vietnam draft, but he broke several of his stepfather's ribs, so that doesn't sound overly credible to me. Back to Joy Bergman. Lewis liked school. He attended the University of Missouri at Kansas City, where he met Leanne Miller. The couple married on Thanksgiving Day, 1968. Leanne became Jim's rock. They were social misfits who fit together. She worked hard to see them through tough financial times. In June 1969, Leanne gave birth to a daughter, Tony Ann. Their joy was unaffected by the baby's Down syndrome and health problems. They had each other. And reportedly, Jim positively doted on his daughter, Tony Ann. He really loved her. Jim and Leanne started working together as bookkeepers for Haley's Instant Tax Service. They moved into its basement and managed the operation for a couple of years. Then one day, Lewis exploded at its owner, Bob Haley. Haley told the Kansas City Star he wanted to take a desk calculator home, and Lewis just blew his stack. Jim and Leanne left to open their own business, Lewis & Lewis Business Tax Service, in a rundown part of Kansas City. They served their clientele from a storefront office with Tony Ann playing happily alongside them. The toddler would often sit in the window and wave at passersby on Troost Avenue. One day, an elderly man named Raymond West waved back. Enchanted by the little girl, West introduced himself to the Lewises and became their client as well as their friend. He tried to comfort them when Tony Ann had to have corrective heart surgery and when she succumbed to complications on December 10th, 1974. New information has surfaced in New York City that raises still more questions about James and Leanne Lewis's connection with the Tylenol murders in Chicago. While the Lewises lived in Kansas City, they had wanted to sue a hospital there after the death of their five-year-old daughter, Tony Ann. The girl had Down syndrome and a heart condition, but there were reports that the Lewises connected the death with hospital medication manufactured by Johnson & Johnson, the makers of Tylenol. Until now, there was no reason to believe that the Lewises might still be carrying a grudge about their child's death. Grief-stricken, the parents continued to talk about their daughter and show off her drawings to clients. But they carried on, and in 1975, moved to a bungalow father up Troost, not far from West's home on Campbell. West, a lifelong bachelor and former truck driver, had lived in the neighborhood with his mother since 1946. By 1977, his mother had died, and West retired to a simple life of daily walks, reading the evening paper on his porch swing, 
and tending his flower garden. That September, a freak flood swept away three area houses and West's car, nearly killing the robust 72-year-old. Neighbors threw him a rope while he struggled against the raging waters. He survived and went right to work repairing his property. Folks were used to seeing West. He liked to be helpful. He saved his newspapers and took them to a local florist every Sunday. On Sunday, July 23, 1978, West went to the florists as usual. A neighbor said he called her later that evening. He reported feeling a little sick, but talked mostly about getting his refrigerator fixed. That was the last anyone heard from him. A longtime friend, Charles Banker, became concerned on Monday when he couldn't reach West by phone. Banker and his wife drove over to West's home to investigate. The couple found the doors locked and West's car in the garage, but their knocks went unanswered. A bedroom shade was raised, revealing an unmade bed. They called police. According to Kansas City Police reports, the responding officer found the house secure and asked Banker about other associates of West who might know where he was. Banker mentioned a few neighbors, including the tax man, Jim Lewis. The officer called Lewis, who reportedly said West had gone to the Ozarks for three or four days with his girlfriend. The information seemed to satisfy the police, but it didn't satisfy Banker. West had never had a romantic involvement during their 30-year friendship, and he never went anywhere significant without telling him. Banker filed a missing persons report. On July 25th, 1978, the Charles P. Banker reported to the missing persons unit that a close friend of his, Raymond West, was missing from his residence at 4812 Campbell and had not been seen since two days prior. Mr. Banker then found a taped note on the front door which read, Mr. West had gone to the Ozarks, signed James Lewis. When the police arrived, Mr. Banker told them about James Lewis, Mr. West's tax man. The house was locked up, which was very unusual. There was a padlock on the front door as opposed to just a door lock. Mr. Banker then stated James Lewis arrived, ran up to the front porch asking, what the hell are you doing? Mr. Banker said that James Lewis picked up a hammer. Mr. Banker said James Lewis eventually calmed down, got into his brown station wagon, and left. Mr. Banker then drove to the bank to see if Mr. West had withdrawn any money from his account. The bank vice president said the bank just received a check made out to James Lewis for $5,000. The check was returned because they felt the check was a forgery. Mr. Banker returned to the residence at 4812 Campbell and smelled a foul odor. He then called the police. In the attic was found a highly decomposed body of a white male, later identified as being Raymond West. Specifically, the bank refused to cash the check for $5,000, or $24,000 today, after they could not contact Ray West to confirm its authenticity. They also found Ray West's body in the attic. The body was so badly decomposed that the coroner could not determine the cause of death, but both of his legs had been severed at the hips. They also found the hoist that had been used to get the body up to the attic, and West's body had been tied up, perhaps as part of using the hoist to get it up there. The signature was that the same slipknot that, that was used to tie the body up was found in the trunk of James Lewis's car. I know my way around knots. I was in the Navy and I was a sailor, and this was not a run-of-the-mill knot. This is a knot that required a little bit of know-how on how to tie knots, and that here we had a sophisticated knot used to tie up Raymond West's body, and that same knot is found in the trunk of James Lewis's car. So the knot suggested another connection between the death of Mr. West and James Lewis. Within hours of discovering the body, police went to Lewis's home, handcuffed him, and took him downtown. They relieved him of his property and put him in a holding cell for an hour. 
He was then taken to an office and questioned for several hours. Lewis explained that the check was a loan West had given him during a morning visit on Sunday, July 23rd. He also said he put the note on West's front door so folks like Banker wouldn't worry. He told police he didn't know anyone who would want to hurt Ray. He submitted fingerprints and a handwriting sample and was released. The following day, police returned to the Lewis home, asking again about the check. The bank had refused to honor it when West couldn't be found to confirm its validity. Banker had told police that Ray was extremely tight with his money. He once gave a neighbor $5 and they joked that he was turning into a big spender. Lewis said the $5,000 was a business expansion loan from West and produced a typed promissory note. The police again took Lewis into custody. Officers asked if he had killed Raymond West. Lewis said no. In late August, the Jackson County Grand Jury charged Lewis with capital murder. But days before the October 1979 trial date, Prosecutor James Bell asked for dismissal of the case. He had no choice. Lewis's defense attorney, Albert Reiterer, had done his job well. In pretrial motions, Reiterer successfully argued police had no probable cause to arrest Lewis the first time. They also neglected to read him his Miranda warning. Every scrap of evidence collected thereafter fell away as inadmissible. Even the original indictment was ruled defective. It omitted the term felonious. Bell was left with a bag of bloody circumstantial evidence and a local coroner who couldn't testify to a cause of death, let alone a homicide. Ryderer had witnesses lined up to talk about West's high blood pressure and potent medication regimen, which could have caused his demise. Lewis's attorney thus proposed a theory that West had died of natural causes, and maybe Lewis then dismembered his body, but he had not murdered him, so yeah. In any event, Lewis was now a free man, because the case against him had fallen apart on technicalities, like the police not having read him his Miranda rights. However, his legal troubles were not over. Kansas City law enforcement thought Lewis was running a criminal enterprise, falsifying credit card applications, and in one instance, instructing the IRS to direct a client's check to the account of a Lewis corporation. Former assistant U.S. attorney Jeremy Margulis summarizes Lewis's method. He would invent an address, pound a mailbox in the ground, pull the mailbox out of the ground, and move on to the next place. It would later come out in federal court that Lewis also faced charges of swindling clients in a land deal in Jackson County. Authorities searched the Lewis home on December 4, 1981, and found typewriter ribbons, mailboxes, credit card applications, and enough other evidence to issue an arrest warrant for James Lewis. So when authorities were about to arrest Lewis on fraud charges, he and Leanne fled and went on the lam. It was at this point that they adopted the names Robert and Nancy Richardson. They moved to the Chicago area. Leanne, or Nancy, got a job at the Lakeside Travel Agency and went to work for Frederick McKay. That brings us back to where we met them, after James had written the letter to Johnson & Johnson to draw attention to what he considered Mr. McKay's shady business dealings. In any event, we have a picture of a really slimy, untrustworthy guy. The apparent 1966 attempt to kill his parents, his involvement in the death and dismemberment of Raymond West, and the mail fraud scheme that he ran out on when the authorities were about to arrest him. So, despite Lewis's claims at his trials that he doesn't lie, cheat, or kill, his previous life history would suggest otherwise. The mail fraud scheme would be all about lying. And the attack on his parents and his involvement with the death of Mr. West would involve killing. And his flight when he was about to be arrested for mail fraud can certainly be considered cheating. And then there's the possible reason that he had to be mad at Johnson & Johnson over the death of his beloved daughter. After the Tylenol murders happened, did law enforcement come up with anything that would shed new light on his previous criminal activities? They did. Uh, when the Kansas City authorities were looking into the death of Raymond West, they found a fingerprint on the hoist that had been used to get his body up to the attic, but they couldn't match the print to James Lewis. However, after the Tylenol murders, the FBI took another look at the print. 
It took another look at a fingerprint you guys weren't able to identify. And what did the FBI find? That that fingerprint was a thumbprint of James Lewis. And that thumbprint was on the hoist that hoisted the dead man's body into the attic and crawl space. My detective was with the evidence in Washington when they discovered the fingerprint matched Lewis. Couldn't you recharge him for murder then? I think the case was resubmitted. Why did that go anywhere? Can't find the hoist. You can't find the hoist. That's what I was told. All I know is when we came back from Chicago, we were in the chief's office, and the property room commander came up and had to tell the chief they can't find it. Oh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of yelling and screaming, yeah. There's no doubt about that. It, it has bothered me for a long time. This would be evidence that James Lewis was somehow involved in West's death, that he had handled the hoist that was used to get the body up to the attic. That still wouldn't prove that Lewis killed West. Uh, he could have found West dead and then decided to haul him up to the attic and dismember him for some reason. Uh, you know, perhaps he found West dead, uh, decided to forge the $5,000 check, and decided to put West in the attic until the check cleared. But it's still a very suspicious set of circumstances, and I would not trust anything that James Lewis told me without independent verification. So what do you make of James Lewis overall? As I watched the five-part painkiller documentary, I was very prepared to accept that Lewis was the killer, and I assumed that this is what would, I would end up concluding had likely happened, you know, for this episode. But as I got down towards the end of the documentary, I kept thinking, you haven't got it. You just don't have compelling reasons to say Lewis was the guy who did it. I mean, yeah, James Lewis was a liar, a creep, and very possibly a murderer. But that doesn't mean he was this murderer, the guy who planted the cyanide. There are lots of shady people, including other people connected with this case, like the first two suspects we mentioned, Kevin Masterson and Roger Arnold. They were weirdos, too. So what makes Lewis the weirdo who did the cyanide? I mean, we don't even know that he had cyanide, where we know that Roger Arnold did. Well, let's start by looking at his motive for inserting himself into the case. He was not actually trying to make a million dollars. The bank account didn't belong to him, and the bank account had been closed, so nobody was going to be getting a million dollars. As bizarre as it sounds, it really does look like he was just a weirdo trying to attract attention to Frederick McCahey because he had a business grudge against him and wanted authorities to look into McCahey's shady activities. As strange as that sounds, that rings true. And after all, the authorities themselves initially thought that the letter was a hoax, which it was, not a serious attempt to get a million dollars. So you need something other than the letter to connect Lewis to the poisonings themselves. What about his discussion of scenarios of how the killer might have done his work, like the drilled board method he came up with? These fell into two phases, uh, conversations with law enforcement before his conviction for the letter and work he did with the authorities after his conviction. Well, if you put yourself into his shoes before his conviction, what the police do when they're investigating you is say things like, you know, if you're not the guy who did it, then give me a scenario I can investigate. What else might have happened? They then encourage you to speculate on what the criminal might have done so they can turn around and portray you as having too much information about the case to be innocent. So now we have Lewis in this situation stupidly acting without a lawyer who could have told him that any such speculations could be turned against him, you know, as they were at trial. Then there's the fact that he volunteered while he was bored and in prison and had lots of time on his hands that, you know, he, he might offer to help in that situation is also intelligible. If they did catch the killer as the result of his help, that would play to his advantage in the first place 
it would take him off the suspect list. So he would not be charged with the murders in the future. And he might even have gotten a shorter stay in prison for his cooperation. Also, he gave him a bunch of different speculations, not just one. So he was giving them a lot of ideas that the killer had not used. As a result, I can't consider these idea generation sessions good evidence that he was the killer. They're also consistent with him just being an overconfident man stupidly talking to law enforcement and giving them ideas that he doesn't realize will be used against him. But they don't prove his involvement, which is why he was never charged. What about his alleged motive of revenge on Johnson & Johnson for his daughter's death? That's very weak. In the first place, we don't have evidence that he bore a grudge against the company. We heard a news report saying that somebody claimed he wanted to sue the company. I don't know if that's true or not, but even if it is, wanting to sue a company and wanting to kill random people to make the company look bad are two entirely different things. I haven't been able to find statements from Lewis saying that he blamed Johnson & Johnson for his daughter's death, much less saying that they got what they deserved with the Tylenol poisonings, much less threatening them, much less of saying anything that would indicate he was in a murderous rage against them. So I view this this claim as weak and speculative. But then, and here comes the twist for this episode, There are good reasons to think not only that James Lewis hasn't been proved to be the killer, there are good reasons to think that James Lewis could not have been the killer. Okay, that's a bit of a bombshell. Why do you say that? For several reasons. Uh, First, James and Leanne Lewis were living in New York City at the time of the poisonings, not Chicago. But the poison Tylenol bottles all showed up on the shelves of Chicago stores at the same time, apparently on the afternoon of Day Zero, Wednesday, September 28th. Well, unless Lewis made a trip to Chicago that day, he couldn't be the person who put the bottles on the shelves. We heard earlier that authorities were checking airline records to see if he had made such a trip, and they never found any record of him flying there under any of his aliases. They also never found records of him going by train or bus or other means. I also checked to see how long it would take to make the drive, and it would have taken at least 12 hours. So if he had made the trip by car, Lewis would have had to have been outside of New York City for considerably more than 24 hours. You know, he'd have to drive at least 12 hours to get there, at least several hours on the afternoon of of day zero to plant the poison, and then at least 12 hours back, and probably more than that because he need to sleep. I don't believe that the Lewises even had a car at this point. They were really living hand-to-mouth in New York City. In fact, in the fall of 1982, they had to hock their wedding rings at a pawn shop so they could buy food, and they never even redeemed their wedding rings afterwards. That's how little money they had. So if they were that financially hard up, How could they afford for Jim to get to Chicago, whether by airplane, bus, or a car that they apparently didn't have? Furthermore, Scott Bartz reports, Records at the Hotel Rutledge showed that Lewis had stayed there from September 6th through October 16th. Kenneth Walton said the Lewises had been staying in room 200, and that the FBI had found their fingerprints in that room. Jim and Leanne were seen leaving the hotel every morning at about 7.30 a.m. and returning after 11 p.m. every night during their entire stay there. Walton said Leanne had reported to work every day between September 20th and October 14th. Jim was seen by Leanne's co-workers every day when he met Leanne for lunch and again when he met her at the end of the workday. Authorities in New York and Chicago had checked all available bus, train, and airline records and found no evidence that Jim and Leanne had ever left New York City from the time they checked into Hotel Rutledge on September 6th to when Lewis was arrested on December 13th. So if this is true, then the the authorities themselves provided James Lewis with an alibi. Jim and Leanne were seen leaving and returning to their hotel room every day. 
Jim was seen meeting, meeting Leanne for lunch every day. And Jim was seen meeting her after work every day. If that's accurate, then he never took off a couple of days to go visit Chicago. Completely apart from explaining how he would have been able to afford such a trip, how he would have evaded leaving a transportation record if he went by airplane, train, or bus, how he would have driven to around Chicago to drop off the poison once he got there if he went by one of those means, or how he would have gotten a car and afforded gas money if he had driven there. That, coupled with the witnesses who said they saw the two of them together every day, not seeing Leanne by herself one day, is a significant argument that Lewis couldn't be the Tylenol killer. Are there other reasons to think that he couldn't be the killer? Several, and one of them is mathematical in nature. When the authorities got the bottles of extra-strength Tylenol, only some of the capsules in them were poisoned. But when the victims took the Tylenol, they each got sick on the very first capsule they took. So what are the odds of that? If every capsule in the bottle were poisoned, the odds of getting a poisoned one with the first capsule you take out would be 100%. But if only 10 capsules out of the 50-count bottle were poisoned, then the odds would only be 20% of being poisoned with the first pill. And it wasn't just one person that got a first pill poisoning. Seven different people each died after taking their first dose from the bottle. And if you do the math, that's just extremely improbable. Scott Bartz has a mathematical appendix uh, in his book, Timers, the 1982 Tylenol Murders, and he does the math and estimates that the odds of this happening for seven people as one in 1,828, or 1,828. What that tells us is that there were probably many more bottles with poison capsules in them than the seven or eight we know about. Some people bought poison bottles and put them on the shelf without taking any of the capsules on September 29th. Other people bought them and took capsules on the 29th, but they were fortunate and took non-poisoned pills. Bartz also estimates how many tainted bottles would have needed to show up on the store shelves on September 28th to explain the seven people who did die on their first dose, and he estimates that it would have needed to be around 40 bottles that got purchased in that 24-hour period to have seven people randomly poisoned on their first dose. That means that there were likely another 32 or 33 poisoned bottles that people had bought, but that we never learned about. They were either thrown out when the authorities initially said to flush the Tylenol you had, or they were thrown in the trash, or if they were turned in, they were simply never tested because it turns out that Johnson & Johnson only tested a small fraction of the bottles that were turned in. However, that estimate of 40 bottles that got purchased may have been only a fraction of the total number of poisoned bottles because the people who purchased them just took single bottles from the shelves and there were other bottles on the shelves that they didn't pick. As Scott Bartz writes, A reasonable estimate of the number of bottles of cyanide laced Tylenol in Chicago area stores can be deduced from information disclosed about the stores where bottles of poisoned Tylenol were purchased. Video clips taken by network news programs shortly after the murders showed various Jewel Osco stores with about 6 to 12 bottles of extra strength Tylenol capsules in the front row of the store's shelves. Some Jewel Osco store managers told NBC News that they were selling one or two bottles of extra-strength Tylenol capsules per day. Feiner said only one contaminated bottle had been found in each affected store, leading him to believe that the capsules had been planted at the front of the shelf. Based on these assumptions, the probability of someone purchasing the one poison bottle from the front row of 6 to 12 bottles is around 1 in 6, or 17%. 
In this scenario, an estimated 235 bottles of cyanide-laced Tylenol capsules were in Chicago area stores on the day of the Tylenol murders. Calculated by dividing 40, the estimated number of bottles of cyanide-laced Tylenol purchased by 17%. Could one man put hundreds of bottles of cyanide-laced Tylenol capsules on the shelves of dozens to a couple hundred Chicago area stores in one day without being caught? This is an important point. With stores only selling one or two bottles per day and multiple bottles on the front of the shelf, in order to have seven people die on their first dose, you'd need a larger number of poison bottles out there, either where people either took a non-poison dose or didn't take a dose at all on the day in question. Bartz estimates that the number of poison bottles needed to be that needed to be purchased were 40, but those 40 were all bought on the same day from a larger selection of bottles. If six bottles were on the front row of a store shelf and only one was poisoned, then you'd need 235 total poison bottles out there. So there may have been more than 200 poison bottles on the shelves that day. But if one person distributed 235 poison bottles in different stores, why didn't anyone notice him doing so? Uh, furthermore, we have good evidence that the bottles all appeared on the shelves on the same day. So how would a single person have been able to go around and plant more than 200 bottles at different stores in a single afternoon? Even if the person put as many as six bottles in each store, replacing the entire front row of bottles, that would mean visiting 40 stores in one afternoon scattered all across the Chicagoland area. This is sounding like something that would be very impractical for an individual person to do. Would that give us evidence that there wasn't a single person and a conspiracy of multiple people was involved instead? It would give us evidence that multiple people were involved, but that wouldn't mean it was a conspiracy because there is another perfectly simple explanation for how so many bottles could show up on the same day. Rack jobbers. Now that's a term not many listeners will know. What's a rack jobber? The term is used in a couple of senses. Uh, first, it's used to refer to a particular type of company. Scott Bartz explains... Rack jobbers are wholesale distribution companies that rent space in retail stores and supermarkets to display and sell products. The people who actually restock the display shelves are also called rack jobbers, or alternatively, merchandisers. Rack jobbers came into prominence in the grocery industry in the 1950s with the entry of supermarkets into non-food product lines. They developed the health and beauty care category for a section of a supermarket or discount store that featured non-prescription drugs and a variety of other products previously sold primarily in pharmacies. Rack jobbers provide retailers the opportunity to earn additional revenue while relieving them of all responsibility for warehousing, reordering, and restocking the products. The rack jobbers create the displays, guarantee the sale of all merchandise, and restock the displays. In return, the supermarket supplies the space and collects a percentage of the gross sales. So rack jobbers are part of the distribution chain that gets over-the-counter medicines into stores. And as I said, the authorities did look into the distribution chain a little. But Johnson & Johnson quickly assured them that their system could not be responsible, and the authorities quickly settled on the idea that a lone crazy citizen was responsible for placing the tainted bottles in the stores. However, if it was actually hundreds of bottles that showed up on the same afternoon, since the deaths were all clustered on a single day, then that raises another possibility. Back to Bart's. The distribution of Tylenol by rack jobbers provides an explanation of how so many bottles of cyanide-laced Tylenol capsules could have turned up in Chicago area stores all at the same time. Sometime before the murders, one or more rack jobbers working their normal sales routes likely restocked the display shelves of dozens or hundreds of Chicago area stores with bottles of extra strength Tylenol capsules. 
Officials surmised that the Tylenol killer had driven highways 90, 94, 290, and 294 following a near circular route. They further concluded that the killer had probably placed the tampered products on store shelves on Tuesday afternoon, September 28th, suggesting that he had no daytime employment or at least no full time employment. However, this daytime delivery actually suggested that the bottles containing cyanide leased Tylenol capsules had been delivered to the stores by gainfully employed rack jobbers. The rack jobbers hypothesis explains how so many bottles could show up in so many stores all on the same day, and it explains it better than a lone crazy individual would. Since it might be a team of rack jobbers putting the bottles in stores, and nobody would think there was anything odd about rack jobbers putting bottles on shelves, so it wouldn't attract any attention. What would the implications of this theory be? Well, it would mean that the authorities took a wrong turn very early on when they went with the lone kook theory. Johnson & Johnson very much wanted the lone kook theory to be true. I mean, it would let them completely off the hook both in terms of publicity as they would be a victim and potentially in terms of legal liability since it wasn't one of their employees or contractors that was responsible. But the authorities would have made a mistake by going with the lone citizen theory. As a result, we would need to look within the distribution chain itself to find out how the poisonings happened. It could be that a lone rack jobber poisoned the capsules and then delivered the bottles on his route, or it could be that it happened further up the distribution chain, like at the warehouse that supplied the individual Chicago land rack jobbers, or at the packaging plant where the capsules were put together. But wherever it happened, it was inside the manufacturing and distribution chain. And the authorities never realized this because of how quickly they went with the lone citizen theory. Could going with this theory give us any idea who might have been responsible? Well, one possibility is actually Roger Arnold. He was a dock worker at Jewel, so he was actually part of the distribution chain to Jewel stores. And he publicly, apparently, talked about poisoning people with cyanide, and he admitted to having cyanide as late as August of 1982, which is when he could have poisoned the bottles of extra-strength Tylenol, even if they weren't distributed for another month. So he's a good suspect worth looking at, but I'm not convinced. The problem is that Arnold is only one tiny piece of the distribution chain. He worked for Juul, and that could explain the poisoned bottles showing up at Juul-owned stores. But as far as I know, Arnold didn't have access to the overall rack jobber network that was likely used to plant hundreds of bottles all at once in multiple different stores. So I think we need to look elsewhere. The idea that rack jobbers were involved in distributing the capsules even if the individual rack jobbers didn't know that the bottles had been poisoned, is promising. But is there anything that seems to clinch the idea that we need to look within the distribution chain for you? Yes, and to see what it was, we need to go back to the case of Lynn Reiner, the mother who had just come home from the hospital after giving birth. All of the other poisonings occurred when people took extra-strength Tylenol, not regular Tylenol, and all of the poison capsules that they found after the killings were extra-strength Tylenol, not regular. Well, Lynn Reiner had gone to a Frank's Finer Foods on the afternoon of day one to buy some Tylenol, but she bought regular strength, not extra strength. And all of the regular strength capsules in her bottle were safe. When tested, none of them had cyanide in them. However, they also found six extra-strength capsules in the bottle, and four of those six contained cyanide. So it looks like there were originally eight extra-strength capsules in the bottle, and Lynn took two of those, which were poisoned. The question is, how did the extra-strength capsules get into a bottle of regular-strength Tylenol, which she bought? And there appears to be a straightforward answer to this question. Bartz explains, Moms like Lynn Reiner were routinely given Tylenol at hospital maternity wards. 
In fact, 90% of all non-prescription pain pills given to hospital patients in 1982 were Tylenol pills. So it makes perfect sense that before Lynn checked out of the hospital on Tuesday, September 28th, she was given a package of eight extra-strength Tylenol capsules. Central DuPage Hospital had converted its pharmacy to a unit dose system in 1974. Unit dose pharmacies received drugs in bulk containers, typically holding 100 to 1,000 pills, and then dispersed the pills in appropriate amounts to inpatients and outpatients. Drugs dispensed at unit dose pharmacies in 1982 were typically packaged at the pharmacy in blister packs or plastic pouches in amounts ranging from one dose to one day's worth of doses. The American Society of Hospital Pharmacists published guidelines in 1980 for hospital pharmacies, stating that for most medications, not more than a 24-hour supply of doses should be provided to outpatients at any one time. Patients checking out of the hospital are considered outpatients. At the then recommended dose of two capsules every six hours, Lynn's eight extra strength Tylenol capsules represented exactly a 24 hour supply. This provides a straightforward explanation for how the extra strength capsules got into Lynn's bottle of regular strength Tylenol. After her birth, the hospital had been giving Lynn Tylenol for pain. And on the day of her discharge, they gave her eight extra strength capsules to get her through the next 24 hours in line with the guidelines of the time. But they said, this will get you through the next 24 hours, but you'll need to purchase some more Tylenol for any pain you have after that. The next day, Lynn went to Frank's Finer's Foods to do that. She bought regular strength Tylenol, perhaps figuring she wouldn't need extra strength anymore since her pain was lessening. She then put the extra strength capsules into her bottle of regular strength, but she did have some pain, so she took two of the extra strength capsules, which were visibly different from the regular strength ones. You know, they had different colors, so you could tell them apart. And the two extra strength capsules she took were among the six that she had been given that had been poisoned. It thus looks like the poisoned capsules that Lynn took came from the hospital pharmacy, not the grocery store. But here's the thing. The cyanide-laced Tylenol capsule that killed Lynn Reiner must have come from a unit dose package dispensed at the closed-door pharmacy in Central DuPage Hospital. That pharmacy was inaccessible to the public, and thus it was inaccessible to the alleged madman who has supposedly put cyanide lace capsules into Tylenol bottles that had been sitting on the shelves of Chicago area retail stores. We thus have evidence that not all of the poison Tylenol came from publicly accessible stores that a madman could get to. Some of it appears to have come from a closed door pharmacy that didn't sell Tylenol in bottles, but gave it to patients in specially prepared packs. That would seem to confirm that the source of the poisoning was higher up in the distribution chain, and someone like Roger Arnold presumably wasn't involved, since he worked for Juul, not for a company that supplied hospital pharmacies. So I think there's quite a strong case to say that the poisonings happened, the poisoning itself happened in the manufacture and distribution chain, and the authorities simply missed this. Unfortunately, I don't know where in the chain it happened, who was responsible, or what their motive may have been, if the poisonings were intentional rather than an accident of some kind. And now, more than 40 years later, it's probably impossible to find out. Is there anything to say about the Tylenol murders from the faith perspective? Well, basically, there are two things. Uh, first, obviously, murder is extremely evil. In fact, to knowingly and deliberately commit murder is a mortal sin that will send you to hell unless you repent. Assuming this wasn't some kind of horrible accident, whoever poisoned the Tylenol bottles killed seven people, and tried to kill even more since more bottles were found to be poisoned. There were probably many more bottles that got discarded or were never tested. So that's extremely grave sin multiplied many times over. 
Further, this person even murdered indiscriminately. and He didn't know the people he was killing, and they hadn't done anything to hurt him, which only increases the evil of these acts. Second, even after all this time, we can still pray for everyone involved in this case. We can pray for the people who died, we can pray for those who were left behind, and we can pray for the killer or killers who were involved. As Pope Benedict XVI pointed out in his encyclical Spes Salvi on Christian Hope, and as we pointed out in episode 208 on time travel prayer, it's never too late to pray for anyone. Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the murders? The 1982 Chicago Tylenol murders were a horrifying experience for the nation and a terrifying experience for the people of Chicago. The authorities quickly adopted the lone crazy citizen hypothesis, and they identified several suspects based on that theory. The suspects may have been eccentric weirdos, and James Lewis was even a lying criminal who may have previously committed a murder. But he appears to have an alibi, since the evidence points to him being in New York City when the poison bottles were distributed in Chicago. Instead, the lone citizen theory is probably wrong and the authorities were mistaken to adopt it. For seven people to get poisoned on the same day when they took their first dose out of bottles that only contained a few poison capsules, there must have been many more bottles that had been purchased. And given how slowly bottles of extra-strength Tylenol sold, often only one or two bottles a day in each store, There must have been an even larger number of poison bottles on the shelves that didn't get bought that day, perhaps as many as 200. This makes it unlikely that a lone individual could distribute so many bottles in so many stores on a single day. It is much more likely that rack jobbers and other distribution workers did the distribution as part of their regular duties. And the fact that Lynn Reiner's extra-strength Tylenol seems to have come from a non-public pharmacy in a hospital strongly suggests that the problem was in the manufacture and distribution chain, and the authorities just missed it. Unfortunately, it is probably too late now to figure out where the problem originated and who is responsible. But we can still pray for everyone affected by this horrible situation. Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have links to Scott Bartz's books, uh, Timers, uh, his book Tylenol Man, and his book Timers NYC. We'll also have a link to the Amazon Netflix documentary Painkiller, The Tylenol Murders, to Chicago Magazine's timeline of events, and to their timeline of the first day of the events, as well as broader information about the Tylenol murders, cyanide, cyanide poisoning, Uh, We'll have Michael Solomon's article on the murders and a photo of the man in the store behind Paula Prince, uh, as well as the Chicago Reader's uh, biography of James Lewis, the video of the interview with him, uh, link to his drawings of possible murder mechanisms, the announcement of his death, as well as an article about his death. And we'll have a SciShow video that questions whether Tylenol actually does anything. There's a surprising case that it's not actually that great as a painkiller, which is, if, would make this story all the more ironic. (laughs) All the more ironic and tragic. Ugh. Yeah. Well, that's it from us on this particular mystery. What are your theories about these 1982 Chicago Tylenol murders? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. They're available for hire, so if you have video and animation work you need done, uh, check them out. You can see what they do by going to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Aiken. 
And while you're there, and by the way, a lot of listeners, you know, say that they really are surprised by how how much the video adds compared to the audio version of the show. Um, while you're there, uh, be sure and like and comment and subscribe to the video channel. I am trying to grow it. And just by liking and commenting and subscribing, you're showing engagement, which tells YouTube that you found the videos I make engaging. And thus, it'll encourage YouTube to show them to other people. So, um, you know, we're currently, at least as of time of recording, we're closing in on getting 50,000 subscribers to the channel. I'd really appreciate it if you became one of those subscribers. So thank you very much. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be talking about one of the strangest and most pivotal poltergeist cases in the history of parapsychology. So we're going to be going to Seafield, New York in 1958 and talk about the spooky story of Popper, the poltergeist. Excellent. Folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast to help us grow this community and reach more listeners. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 294. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And by... Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. And by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bethanelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.